In the free market, no one can get a penny from you unless you voluntarily give it to them in exchange for a product or service. The state takes any amount for any reason and promises to cage or murder those who resist. Welcome to Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone. I want to get into the different mindset that socialists and libertarians have with regard to the economy in general. Here I say, socialism equals give us your property and obey us, or we'll murder you. In other words, if you don't want to chip in for the warfare state, the welfare state, state education, well, they don't just allow you to opt out. They don't say, I'm so sorry we're not meeting your demand. What else can we do to change? Maybe you'll chip in next year. How can we increase quality? What else can we do? Uh, we're so sorry for providing an inconvenient service. They say, well, we'll put you in a cage, and if you resist, we will have you shot. So that is the heart of what I'm getting at. So Godfather says, capitalism equals let's turn everything into a commodity for profit. Uh, not everything. Uh, people have conversations, people have kids, people have meetings, people volunteer, people engage in charity, so uh, let's, let's not totally exaggerate. Regardless of who suffers profit greater than human life or health care, he's assuming that these things uh, can in no way be complementary. There's a lot of ways that uh, private greed can be harnessed in such a way that it serves the public good. This is generally what the invisible hand is. So if I just look at my desk, I see a uh, book, a computer, a microphone, and a router, and a printer, and some pictures, and a ceiling fan. Well, uh, this was not exactly made by the people because they knew Keith Knight, don't tread on anyone, needed to make a show. They did it for themselves in hopes they could outcompete other people and make money for themselves. There's nothing wrong at all with this. In the same way, you know, people pursuing their own economic interest is no different than Godfather uh, only tweeting what he wants to tweet. Shouldn't we put this up to a vote about what he should tweet about? No, it's okay that uh, people sort of do their own thing in the uh, marketplace, in the division of labor. So I said, the supermarket offers me food and drinks at a low price for profit. Also, uh, profit just means uh, when uh, benefits exceed costs. So you could profit from time spent with family. You could profit when you spend 50 cents to go to work on gasoline and you make $100 at work that day. Well, you've profited $99.50. There's Even if you have, you know, anarcho-syndicalism, uh, you have... Uh, profit. If you have natural law, resource-based economy, no money, people will still profit. It's impossible to get rid of. Let's compare that to what you are willing to offer me and give me and see if profit benefits me or leftists wanting to feel good gets me fed. Please list everything you offer me for free. Thanks in advance. He says, that's not how this works, buddy. Which I knew, but he's not uh, obviously grasping the implications. He's saying, look at this terrible thing. And I'm saying the thing's not that terrible. It incre it gives millions of people access to products and services at a low price. Quality increases. Prices tend to go down so long as there's not state interference. If you look at TVs or microphones or computers uh, or books, prices tend to go down. But except uh, in things like, you know, healthcare, housing, or... Uh, college where uh, the state heavily interferes because there's less competition, less innovation, and uh, no voluntary funding. That's not how this works, buddy. I said, in summary, profit seekers make my life better, and you are a parasite advocating theft, aka taxation. Take care. He says, LMFAO might want to educate yourself on political philosophy. You seem completely clueless. LOL at calling taxation theft. You're an income poop. I said, oh my bad, I thought it was theft. Now give me 20% uh, of your money or I'll have my employees cage you. Because surely, I mean, if it's not theft, if there's nothing wrong with it, well, then I can do it. You said there's nothing wrong with it, so I'm going to do it. And Amazon can do it. And the Koch brothers can do it. And Hobby Lobby can uh, just go around issuing taxes. There's nothing wrong with it. He says... <laughs> He then says, that would be a bargain considering the government takes 40% of my income in taxes. Uh, yes, it is actually the same guy in this. So let's, 
Let's get on. Let's get on to uh, the article. Social desirability bias versus tourism by Brian Kaplan. Social desirability bias is defined as a type of response bias that is the tendency of survey respondents to answer questions in a manner that will be viewed favorably by others. In the Yucatan, we stayed at several all-inclusive resorts. These resorts were a good fit for my family. When you're traveling in a third world country with four kids during a pandemic, you want a convenient supply of abundant and tasty food and enough variety to please each and every picky eater, me included. Since portions were smallish, we routinely ordered 12 to 15 dinners for dinner, all at zero marginal cost. At least in Mexican resorts, tips are appreciated, but not expected. Economically speaking, there's a straightforward win-win case for these Mexican resorts. Not only do they make the tourists happier, they make the Mexican people happier by providing them with better opportunities than they have elsewhere in the Mexican economy. If you reconsider this verdict through the distorted lens of social desirability bias, though a radically different picture appears before your eyes. Once you forget economics, you could easily describe the resort experience in the following sordid way. A bunch of rich foreigners show up in a poor country and take advantage of the locals' desperate poverty. The foreigners relax in the sun and stuff themselves on fried fish and cascatan. Mmm. While the poor Mexicans wait on them hand and foot, the Mexicans toil long hours for low pay while the rich foreigners cavalierly order margarita after margarita, tequila after tequila. The rich foreigners don't even bother to pick up after their fat, lazy selves every day. Poor women of color clean their rooms and make their beds. Most of the foreigners treat the workers like inferiors with a typical attitude somewhere between demanding and rude. Yet, no matter how rude the guests may be, their impoverished workers are required to kiss up to their guests, expressing warmest regards for foreigners who have never spent a single day in poverty is in the job description. And, at the end of each meal, the workers can't even count on a tip. Now, Suppose Mexican law prohibited such resorts, and you wanted to end the ban. Just imagine how easily the defenders of the status quo could demagogue. Demagogue is defined as a leader who obtains power by means of impassioned appeals to the emotions and prejudices of the populace. These resorts allow rich foreigners to exploit poor Mexicans. Back to this example. Yes, uh, someone is profiting and benefiting from surplus value. So what? I'm benefiting because I get something in exchange. Whether it's food, drink, a job, a product, or service. There's nothing terrible about what's going on here. It's a, another win-win situation. These resorts allow rich foreigners to exploit poor Mexicans. They are an affront to decency, to dignity, why should we let rich foreigners gorge themselves while innocent Mexican children go to bed hungry? Mexicans deserve good jobs, not this basura. So in other words, just as in the case of, hey, yeah, they're profiting, but they make my life better off. And you, sir, are offering me nothing. Either offer me nothing. Oh, pronouns in bio? Ah, no, just BLM. Um, you, sir, offer me nothing. So you are worse than them. What you can do is offer me something in exchange since you're very passionate about it. But their response is to either outlaw jobs that are low paying or in quote bad conditions. But if they don't have any other opportunity for you to go to, well, then they're just restricting your right to engage in something voluntarily. The result of this demagoguery naturally would be to prevent Mexicans from bettering their condition. Bettering. What a great concept. It captures the idea of improvement without falsely promising that the end result will be good in absolute terms. The key economic point. Banning resorts saves no Mexican children from hunger. Banning resorts would rather cause Mexican children to be hungry by depriving their parents of the best jobs they can 
get. So not purchasing uh, third world products doesn't mean those people in the third world working these terrible jobs are now rich. It means they are worse off than they otherwise would. They usually either go into uh, prostitution or die of uh, starvation. The reason why Mexicans toil in all-inclusive resorts despite the obvious drawbacks is that their other prospects are worse, often much worse. Just talk to the guy desperately peddling straw hats on the beach. At this point, it's tempting to enthuse. Let's just have a dialogue about this. The demagogues have their view. Economists have theirs. Let's try to reach a consensus. To this, I once again say dialogue. We don't need no stinking dialogue. Dialogue hands social desirability bias a massive home field advantage. Far better to let observed choices prevail over mere words. Keyword is choices. We're still respecting the self-ownership principle of parties involved. Still, how can rich foreign tourists be happy at their resorts? To truth be told, the vast majority are. Like almost all human beings, selfish and ob oblivious. This, I don't think, is anything terrible. Adam Smith always said um, in a theory of moral sentiments, uh, if a million people across the planet Earth died by tsunami, you might be sad a little bit, but you, you'd go on after, you know, a, a couple hours, maybe a day or two. But if you lost your pinky finger and it was cut off, that would be such an inconvenience. You'd constantly mourn over it all the time. It, it, I don't know if that's necessarily being selfish and oblivious and uncaring to have, you know, some sort of uh, self-interest. Um, Kaplan continues, and that's largely for the best. If the tourists' consciences pained them, their main reaction would be to stay home, not to come, and tip generously. What about me? I may be just as selfish as the rest of the tourists, but since social science is my life, I can't be oblivious to any social world around me. What keeps me feeling comfortable, honestly, is the faces of the workers. Even when they're off the job, most of them seem quite content. Well, I wouldn't want to have their jobs. The magic of hedonic adaption allows even humble resort employees to feel pretty good about their lives. That's not just psychological theory. It's observed fact. What he's talking about here is hedonic adaption is the observed tendency of humans to quickly return to a relatively stable level of happiness despite major positive or negative events or life changes. According to this theory, as a person makes more money, expectations and desires rise in tandem, which results in no permanent gain to happiness. The broader lesson, as I tell my kids at a young age, many things in life sound bad, but are good. Rich foreigners living it up in the third world is one of those things, and the list goes on and on. Thank you for watching, Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone.